Oops. Okay, hi everyone. Um, we'll make a start. Um, my name's Toby Clark. I work at Arup. Um, I taught here a couple of years ago, and tonight we're going to talk about Rhino and Grasshopper again. But we're going to introduce you to a plugin that's available in Grasshopper called Kangaroo, right? And Kangaroo is a way to simulate physics inside Grasshopper and Rhino, right? <coughs> so think of it as a very simple physics engine. It's not really analytical. It's just the ability to apply forces in, onto objects in, in, in the Rhino and Grasshopper canvas. And the ability, why we might want to do that as engineers or designers or architects, <laughs> is the fact that we can then form shapes which have been um, things like Gaudi's um, Sagrada Familia, obviously they simulated behaviours and the forms by simple methods of attaching weights, which in a sense is a simple physics, physical engine, right? They attach a bunch of weights, you get these nice catenary arches. Other people have done similar things. If we look at the work of Fry Otto, he did very similar things. Cable net structures, stretch between points, and he made big physical models because in those days you couldn't really um, analytically find the shape. So um, they had to simulate the behavior through physical models, right? And people have done other things. If we look at uh, Felix Candela, he makes very thin shell structures, which are again um, formed in, in these traditional methods. And the work of um, Eisler, I think this is, right? Again, it's very physical based modeling because the, the software of those days wasn't really available. So what they would often do, it was they'd simulate the gravity, they would turn things upside down, and they would hang them from points, and therefore they would get these shell structures, right? Fine. But nowadays, of course, we have computers a bit more powerful than back then, and we can now simulate these behaviors very easily, very quickly, in, in a wide variety of software. So what we're going to do is introduce you to the basic concepts of that inside Grasshopper, right? And then um, I think maybe in another class we'll talk about maybe taking that form that we've basically form found very simply and then maybe analyzing it further to actually, um, to actually then get a proper model, right? Because this isn't this isn't proper engineering, it's just simple form finding to get an initial starting shape, okay? So, Andrew said you should go into a proper different way here. I'm going to forget which way it was. Um, if you go all programs, civil engineering, Rhino 5, and hit set up plugins, that'll ensure that all the plugins we need for today's lesson will be up and running, yeah? And then, once you've done that, I'll run a batch file, and then open Rhino 5, uh, and then open Grasshopper. You should all know how to do that, right? If you've opened Rhino already, you, you will need to run the batch file, and you'll need to ensure at the top here, you have Kangaroo 2, right? It should say Kangaroo 2. There's been a new release of the software, and we want Kangaroo 2 for today's lesson. So if anyone doesn't have Kangaroo 2, please say it now. If nobody says anything, I assume we're all okay. Right? So what we're going to do is simulate some basic functions first. And I really understand how the software tries to simulate these physical behavior. Right? And if you can see along the top here, they've reorganized it. If you've... If you look at kangaroo, I mean, some of you might have kangaroo, but we're not going to look at that. We've reorganized it now into different goals, right? And these goals are the, uh, what drives a physics engine. We all okay? Yep. So the goals are what drives a physics engine. We then have the engines over here, right? And they're different engines. And then we have some utility tools that help us um, clean up the geometry to allow these physics engines to run, Yeah. So what we're going to do is just simply take two points in space and we're going to draw a spring in between them and then we're going to try to move it around and see if we can sort of simulate a spring, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to draw two points. So we want to go to parameters, 
we want to draw a point, we can drag it on the canvas, and we've got two of them, right? I don't, we're going to draw, in Rhino, we're going to draw, no, I don't need to draw physical points for this. We'll, we'll show you a way to manipulate geometry that we draw in the canvas without actually having physical geometry in Rhino, right? So we're going to just draw a point, and I'm going to say set one point, right? Don't care where it is, and maybe keep it in the top view for now. Right? I'm going to draw another point, doesn't matter where, and I'm going to leave it like that. Okay? So there are two points, and we're going to draw a spring in between. Now, we represent that spring with a line. So we'll just draw a line between two points. If we go to curve, primitive, and line, we can draw a line between two points. Yeah? At the moment, I can't obviously move that. I can't do anything to it. And this is where we're going to start looking at kangaroo. So it has, as I said, a bunch of different goals and a bunch of different engines. For this um, exercise, for this exercise, we'll use what we call the bouncy solver, right? The bouncy solver just looks nice because it, what it does is bounces the simulation. It just allows us maybe to more visualize what's happening, okay? And it will all come apparent when we start using it, hopefully. So we'll drag the solver onto the canvas. Okay? What we need to do now is set up a spring. Okay? And the spring, we're going to use the line. And we're going to say, try to keep the line length the same length. So when we move the point, it's going to try to keep the line length all the time. So if we move one point, the line will stay the same, right? So let's go to goals, and we'll look for the one that's called line, right, goals, lines, and we'll bring it down here and we'll call length of the line, and we'll drag it onto the canvas. What we also need is a way to pick up that point and move the point. Now, if we go to the main toolbar, we have something called grab, right, and if you hover over it, it should tell you what it does, right? This lets you drag particles in Rhino, and you hold the Alt key and drag with the left, left mouse button, right? So let's drag it onto the canvas, yeah? Now, the way that it works is you basically have an ability to, if you look at the engine itself, right, you have goal objects, you have a couple of other things which, in general, you probably don't need to change, right? Threshold, tolerance, and damping and iterations, I would leave generally as it is set to default, right? If the behavior is not working, maybe we'll then look at those changing those values. But for this case, we'll, we'll leave it as, um, as default. And then there's an on button, which is basically a Boolean which says true or false. So what we can do is we can turn the, um, the engine off at any point, right? Or we can reset it. So what I want for that is I want a button that allows me to just turn it off and on. And that also is going to work as a reset. So I'm just going to double click on the canvas and type button. And I'm going to get a button. Yeah? So clearly, the line, here's my line length. And if you hover over length, it tells you the default value. If you don't put a length value in there, if none provided, starting length will be used, right? So what we want to do is keep the line length exactly the same. So we're not going to put it a value here. We could say, if we had a bunch of lines, we could use a target value of averaging all those lines, right? So draw a bunch of lines and then use the springs to average out all of those lines. But we're not going to do that. For this simple example, we're just going to use the original starting length. So just plug it into there, right? We now have... Um, goal object. So that's going to be one of our goal objects, right? And then I want to plug in the ability, the, the grab button as well. So I'm going to hold the shift key down. So when you get the little plus sign like that, yeah? And I'm going to drag it into goal objects as well. Now the reason it's orange is because it's not going to do anything until I actually activate it. Which if you hover over it again, it says hold the Alt key and drag with the left mouse button. So let's see what happens, see if we can actually do that. So I'm going to, on the canvas, I'm going to hold the Alt key down 
and we're going to use the left mouse button to see if I can drag the particle. And it's not working. I need to turn that on. Now, I'm not going to use that. I might actually just use a toggle. Okay, sorry, you need to put a toggle here to say true. And let's use the button. Let's use the button command to say reset, sorry. You want the button to reset it, and you want the toggle to say true to turn the engine on. Yeah? So now if I hit, hold the Alt key and the left mouse button, I can drag that around. Yeah? And you can see it's sort of bouncing. As I move the point around, we've got a spring between those two, trying to keep the length exactly the same. Does that all work for everyone? And what you're seeing is the original line. So if we don't want to see that, right-click off the objects. So select the objects, right-click somewhere else, and turn the preview off. Again, to move it, Alt key, and you can drag that around. Either end, it doesn't matter. But you've got to pick from the point, right? You can't pick the line. And if I hit the reset button, it'll go back to its original position, right? Yeah? No? Yes. Okay. So, a very, very simple spring, right? You've got two points. We've got a line in between representing the spring. And if we've set its length, as you move the objects around, it's going to keep that behavior locked in. Right? Which is impossible to do in Rhino. Typically, if you move one point, it's not actually that easy. We're now going to say there's other behaviors we can do here as a simple um, mechanism. What we could do is we could draw a third point and another line. So I'm going to copy this. A, a third point on the canvas. I'm going to say set point and we're going to draw it somewhere else. If you want to preview it back on so you see where you've picked it. I want another curve. I want another line component. So I'm going to go primitive. I'm going to go line. I'm going to set up another force object. Right? I'm going to hold the shift key down again. I'm going to drag it in. So you now should have three wires into the engine. If I turn those objects off, right, now what happens? I've now got like a linkage, yeah? It's always trying to keep those line lengths the same. And I can now move it as a link. If I reset it, it'll go back to its original position, right? So you now have kind of a, a spring link, linkage system. Pretty basic so far? We're following? Anyone need help? Put your hand up because we will keep going. If you get stuck some point, please just put your hand up. Otherwise, Connor will get bored. Yeah? Yeah? So what, we could, what else could we do here? Maybe when we move this, um, these, these, ob these springs around, we maybe want to keep the angle between the two springs constant. Yeah? Maybe it's like... Um, some bracing in a truss or something, and we want to set up some sort of physical representation of this. We want to keep the angle constant. We might want to move the points, but keep that angle constant. So can we find one of those as a, as a goal object? So we've got goals, and there's one called angle. Yeah? There's lots of different goals here. And we're going to set the angle. We'll drag that onto the canvas. And again, if we look at the inputs, it should be fairly easy. Right? It has a rest angle, and again, if we hover over that, it says rest angle in radians, and if there is none provided, it'll take the default angle. Right? So it'll take the angle that the lines are originally, so we can use that. And it has two, um, two line segments, so clearly those are our line segments. And we're now going to drag another force into the engine. Right? So now we should have four components into one engine. Yeah. 
And what I'm going to do here, which may be a little bit different, and maybe we haven't talked about, and if on all of those components you have a strength, right? So you can give preference to some part of the system over other parts of the system. You can say this part of the system should be solving higher, is, a, is, is much more important to me than another part. So what I want to do is I really want to lock that angle in, right? So I'm going to, instead of just giving it a strength of 1, I'm going to give it a, a higher strength value. So I want to give it some numbers, and as we know, right, there are multiple ways to put numbers on Grasshopper. We can do a panel, we can do a slider, yeah? So up to you. I'm going to do a slider, and I'm going to use a shortcut key. I'm going to go 1, because I want a slider that starts at 1, and I'm going to go dot, dot, and I'm going to go 20.0, yeah? So 1, dot, dot, 20.0, if I hit enter, I now have a slider that goes between 1 and 20, with one decimal place accuracy, yeah? So that's a good shortcut if you're putting lots of sliders on your canvas. One, just the number, dot, dot, and a second number with a decimal place is how, how many you want will give you a slider of that domain. So you can put that into the strength. Now what happens? So Alt key and move this. So now what you see is it's actually keeping the angle between those two elements. Yeah? I could change the strength all the way down to 1, and the angle's no longer important. So it's, it's still solving it, but it's not quite having the same urgency in solving it, right? And if I, had, if I changed some other factor, maybe it wouldn't actually, that wouldn't be the goal, the main goal for the engine to solve for. So you can set strengths of all of the goal objects when you put it into the ed engine. Yeah? So that's super, super basic. That's just 101 kangaroo, yeah? Now we're going to do something maybe a little bit more specific to the building community and engineering. We're going to do something a bit more um, involved. So is there any questions at all on that? No? That's good, I think. Um, you can save it if you want to, um, and you can start a new document. And what we're going to do now is something a bit more involved. We're actually going to try to simulate um, uh, behavior of a fabric in, in kangaroo, right? We're going to actually try to assume, let's take a fabric and we're going to... Um, put some forces in, into, the, into the fabric and we'll see if it can, we can make it change behavior and change, make it change shape, right? So, um, obviously Rhino is a NURBS modeler. We, I don't know if you probably got introduced to NURBS modeling, right? But for the solving of, um, of kangaroo, it really only handles points, lines, and meshes, right? So if we draw a surface in Rhino, we need to mesh it first, right? So we, if we draw a surface, we need to mesh it to get out um, the network of uh, springs that we need to modify the system. So in this case, we don't have a starting surface. We're going to start really simple. We're just going to start with a base mesh, and we're going to define how many, um, how many mesh faces are in it in each x and y direction, right? Very simple mesh surface. So if we get a mesh... And if we go to um, primitive, you can do a mesh plane, right? Let's create a mesh plane. It's going to, if we drag it onto the canvas, we'll see what the inputs are. It basically has a, um, a base rect rectangle size. And then it has um, the number of faces in the x and y direction, right? So we could actually put in um, a base rectangle and we could give it a dimension, it could be rectangular, it could be square. But for this example, we're just going to increase the number of faces in the x and y direction. If, like me, on the canvas, 
you draw the mesh and you just see one object, what we need to do is go to display and preview mesh edges. Mesh edges, right? If you do that, you'll actually see that the mesh itself is made up of many faces. Right? And that's important. We want we want that density of mesh to allow these springs to, to interact with our surface. And I want actually more than that. So I'm just going to put parameters and a panel. And I'm going to double click in there and I'm going to type 20. Right? So I'm increasing the density. And I think that density for this exercise is about right. Depending on what you want to do, you may want to decrease or increase that density. For helping me out later on, I'm going to just put that mesh into a container. And if I go to uh, geometry, the parameters, and I want mesh, I just want a little container here to hold that mesh. Yeah? I'm just copying the data into another component, so later on, if I want to put something in between those two components, it's quite easy to do. Yeah? Now, there are a number of things that I want to get out of this mesh, right? Because I said, the, 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 the engine of Kangaroo really operates on lines, springs, and, and, and nodes, um, points, <coughs> right? So I want to decompose the mesh and get out the lines and points, right? So we can then give them um, forces. So what do we want? If we go to Kangaroo 2, and if we go to Utilities, it has some little objects that might help us here. I want some mesh corners, yeah? And we'll drag it onto the canvas. And I'm going to plug in... I'm going to plug that in. And what that gives me is the four corners of the mesh, right? So what I'm going to want to do to this fabric is I want to hold it down somewhere so it doesn't just scrunch up into a ball when I put the springs in. I want to hold the mesh down and then apply some forces to it and see what we can deform the shape. Yeah? And we can, do, we can deform this in many different ways. But it's important that you hold it down somewhere. If you don't hold it down, the thing will just go... Yeah? So you've got to hold it down. And you don't have to hold it down in the corners, but for this example, it's the easiest way. Okay, so we've got, we got the corners. What else do we want? Okay, so we want to decompose the mesh fully. I'm going to go to mesh. I'm going to go to uh, analysis, if I get it right. And I'm going to go deconstruct mesh, right? I'm going to drag it onto the canvas. And I'm going to plug that in. If we hover over the outputs, well, actually, we might want to put a panel in just to see what we're getting. So V is the vertices. V is, um, is the vertices that make up that mesh, right? All the point data that defines the mesh, right? Faces is the connectivity of all of those meshes, right? A mesh data, a mesh definition is very simple. Unlike nerves geometry, which is has long, complex formatures to, do, to, to describe the surface, a mesh is only described via points and the connectivity of those points, right? If you've done analytical work, most of your analy analysis will be done on meshes, not nerve surfaces, because it can't be done. So um, it's very simple. But all we want in this case is the vertices. We don't really care about that connectivity of the mesh, the vertices. Colors, we haven't assigned any colors. And the mesh normals, we don't care about either, right? We just want those points. So I'm going to put them into a little container just to help me out later on of points. Yeah? And now I want to extract out the springs or the lines in that mesh to apply those spring forces onto. Yeah? So I'm going to go to mesh again and I'm going to go to mesh edges. Yeah? Because at the moment we don't have any lines. We could try to work out the connectivity of faces and we could work out all the vertices and somehow draw a bunch of lines, but there's already a component to do that for us, so it's quite helpful. We're going to plug the mesh in, and we've now got a series of lines, right? We've now got a series of lines representing our mesh faces. 
It's got three outputs. It's got one that represents the naked edge, right? So we've got a series of lines. So the way to visualize this would be to put a container on the canvas. And we'll go to geometry and we'll go to curve. And we'll put one of the edges into a curve component, right? Now, hopefully you can see, we're just picking up the edge curve, right? Which is important for what we want to do. Because we might want to say that the edge curve maybe has a cable along the edge and we want a certain stiffness in that, right? And the other bit, which is, if I copy that down, E2, is the line's internal, right? So this might just be fabric we're representing in here, and it might be a bit softer. We might have a stiffer edge cable, we might have a softer fabric, right? So it's, this component is very handy because it allows us to separate those two um, springs in, into separate um, lists. So what did we do before? So with springs, we want the same component we used before. We'll go to Kangaroo 2. And we go to main. In this time, we could do the bouncy solver. Why not? It looks better. Everything bounces. Maybe people like that. The other solver I would suggest is that one, right? Um, which is just the main solver. It's the main solver in the engine. It just looks less dynamic. And for the example, maybe today, uh, I don't. Then I, maybe it's nice to see it all bounce and look dynamic. Yeah. So we need some forces, right? So goals, lines. We want length line again. We want two of those because we're going to have two springs, one representing the edge and one representing the internal lines. So we have two of them. And again, as I said, we're going to maybe set up different stiffnesses here and see what happens when we do that. So I want some, I want some sliders here and giving me the ability to set the, um, to set the length. And um, I'm going to do a slider that goes between, I don't know, 5 uh, dot dot uh, 20.0. Okay, so there's my strength. I'm going to put in the lines. In this case, right, I don't want my line length to stay the same, right? I want this to be a, um, imagine a piece of elastic we've stretched, and the natural behavior of that elastic is to go back to zero, right? That's our spring behavior. I've stretched something, and naturally it wants to go back to zero, right? Imagine this is like, it's a piece of elastic we've stretched, and if we don't hold it down in the corners, it just all crumples together. So what we're going to set, our line length, our target length here, is zero, right? It's not the length, the starting length. We're going to set it and hopefully make all those springs try to force its way together. So we're going to say that the line length here is zero. So I want to, to remind myself I've done that, I'm just going to put a little thing here. I'm going to type zero, and I'm going to go target length. And I'm going to plug it in. Yeah? So this one, which are our four corner points, right? As I said, now we've set these springs to retract and go to zero. We want to hold the edges down. We, want, we don't want this, the whole thing to collapse on itself. We need to hold it down in some points. So if we go to Kangaroo 2 again, luckily we have some goals. And one of those goals that we can allow for is anchors, yeah? We have some points that come out of here. And I'm going to drag that into there, right? Which is points to anchor. If you, if you go down a little bit more, you've got a target, right? So you could actually have a starting position for your anchor and a target value for the anchor. And it will try to pull that to the target. Yeah, and again, it has a strength value. Yeah, and normally because we don't want this to move at all, we want those anchor points rock solid. We've got a really high value. We've got like a thousand, right? And all the other ones are normally about one or two. So it's really going to try to anchor it down as hard as possible. Yeah. 
Now, in this case, we have a mesh, right? And before, we just had some lines and, and some points, and it was really easy to visualize that. The engine did all that for us. It was really easy to see it. If we want to see that mesh again, we just need to tell the engine that we want to see the mesh, right? So if we go to main, it has something called show. So we want to drag that onto the canvas, and we want to drag that this container into show, yeah? And that is also a goal in a way, right? We want to keep actually visualizing the mesh. Okay, so now we need to combine them all in to our engine, yeah? Before we do that, though, it's just a little bit of management here because now we're starting to get a few values and a few goals and a few different things. We might want to manage that a little bit better than normal. So I'm going to go to set and I'm going right to the end to trees and I'm going to go to entwine. It just says flatten and combine a collection of data streams. It just allows us to maybe um, put a whole lot of targets and a whole lot of goals into one thing and then feed it into the engine without holding the shift key down all the time. So the first one, it's this, now this is important, right? The, the first one that I really I want to put in is the show component, right? So that's going to be my first object in the list. And whatever I do after that, it doesn't really matter the order too much because when it comes out of the engine, I want to display the first thing that comes out of the engine. And the first thing that will come out of the engine will be the mesh. And I, I'll be able to see it. If we, don't, if we don't make it the first one, it'll be somewhere in the list and it'll be hard to visualize it, right? It'll become apparent when we see the outputs from the engine. And the other ones, I could just feed in. And if we zoom in, I think we can just add them, yeah? As soon as I plug it in, Hopefully you've got something like that happening, right? So there's a few things we need to do, like we did on the other one. Let's put a toggle, and let's put a button. So I want to be able to reset it, and I want to be able to turn the engine on and off. We all there? What I might want to do We all okay? I'm just gonna on the input for the goal objects, you can see the structure of the data. If you remember from uh, I think Mr. Connor taught that class, data trees, right? We now have our data structure in a data tree. Right, which is a list of a lists. We don't really need that, so I'm just going to flatten it. Right? I'm just going to, on the input of goal objects, I'm going to right click and I'm going to go flatten. And it's just going to flatten it into a flat list. Yeah? I'm going to go to the end here, I'm going to go sets, I'm going to go list, and I want a list item. At the, at, and my outputs there, let's have a look at what the outputs are. Let's put a panel on there and have a look. So, as you can see, it's basically taking some of the values we've put in and giving us the results of those values. So, the, oh, first. I don't really understand why, but for some reason, the anchor points haven't changed any values, and so they're null, right? And then we have a bunch of new line lengths for all of our springs, and we have the mesh. Maybe you don't... The reason why I said put it in the, this entwine component, this component, is now because all we want to see is the mesh. I don't care about what the springs have done, I just want to see the mesh. So I'm going to just take that away, I'm going to put that into there, 
and I now, if I take all of these over here, select everything, so just select everything, and right click somewhere off them all, and turn them off. And I'm going to turn the engine off. Right? So I'm just seeing the deformed mesh. Yeah? Does everyone know how I did that? I selected everything but the output, the list item, and I right click somewhere on the cat off the off them and turn them off. Yeah? <coughs> this will help you see what the engine is now doing. Is everyone clear on that? If again if you're stuck at any point, put your hand up. So we understand what's happened here, right? This mesh, all of those line lengths have tried to go to zero, and we've anchored it down on the corner points, and they've shrunk in. Yeah? As I said, we separated those edge curves. We've got two edge curves. I put the same slider into both as a starting one, yeah? And I can change the value, and not much is happening. What if I control copy and change the sliders? And let's see if I actually increase the stiffness of the edge, what happens? Yeah? So that's one way now to say this edge curve has a different behavior to the internal curves. Yeah? Everyone kind of clear what's going on? I guess so. Yeah. Okay, so at the moment, if we just turn to um, perspective view, so if we go to the little car icon and go perspective, um, my little thing is in the middle here, right? It's just a piece of flat fabric which we've, um, which we've shrunk, right? What if we wanted to do like the hanging chain model? What if we wanted to say... Let's invert this. Let's assume this has some weight on it. Gravity is acting upon it. And we now make it like a shell structure. Right? So we can now apply a force of gravity onto this object. Right? And again, if we go to kangaroo, it should be, we can go to goal points. And one of the things there that says the load. Right? So we can apply a load to all of our um, vertices of the mesh. Right? Now, understanding what the values mean, right, in kangaroo is quite difficult, right? Sometimes you want a slider that goes between 5 and 20, sometimes you want one that goes between 0.1 to 1, right? getting these values is a bit of hit and miss, right? Because these aren't real <coughs> forces we can do. You can think about it and come up with ratios if you know something's ten times stiffer than something else. You can set up those behaviours, right? In this case, right, we're going to take the points of our vertices, of our mesh, and we're going to plug it into the one that's called load. In fact, I'm just going to move that down here so it's a bit easier to use. Right? I'm going to, I need a, it has a force vector, right? So basically what we're going to do is apply a load, and we're going to apply a load by using a vector and a force for that vector, right? And the vector is, ba the force is defined by that vector length. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to, I could do like a hanging chain, right, and imply negative gravity. I don't need to do that. I could just play a, a force in the z direction, and I could define what that force is. So what do I want to do? I want to go to vectors. I want to go to vector. I want to go uh, unit z, right? I can plug that into there. But now I want to give that unit z vector 
a length. I want to give it a force. So I want to say, I want a slider that gives some range of values. Now for this one, we're going to start really low, right? We're going to put a really low force into our, into our pushing up to see what happens. If you start with a really high number, the thing might go into the sky. So I'm just going to start with a real low number. I might go uh, 0 0.5 dot dot uh, 2.0. I'm now going to drag that fourth value into my entwine. All clear? Yeah? So what would happen if I change some values? Obviously if I increase my load on those nodes, the thing will get stretchier and stretchier and go higher into the sky. So even though I've only got a force of two, it's already looking a bit ridiculous. Yeah. So that's why you, it is a bit of playing around to understand the values, right? If you start with a, if you plug something in, so let's just say I plugged in here a slider that went from 50 to 100. I'm like, whoa, what's happening, right? It's gone crazy. I'm like, uh, this thing is useless, it doesn't work. Just try putting in lower numbers, yeah? If you start off with really high value, sometimes the behavior is not what you expect. And again, if I change my stiffness, I can change the values. If this one, I actually maybe want to make that stiffer um, or um, Maybe I want to increase that. I'm just going to increase that by double clicking on it. Yeah. And you can start to shape this. Yeah. Okay. If I'm going too fast or I'm going too slow, please say something and I will either speed up or slow down. Yeah? You're a quiet bunch, you don't like to say anything, that's fair enough. Um, so, what I'm going to do now. Hmm? Yeah. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to say, okay, let's see if we can pick those edge points up and see what happens, right? We're going to just try to manipulate the shape and see what happens. Um, and then we're going to put we're going to put a beam in there and see if we can use that and we're going to drape the fabric over a beam. Yeah? Maybe that's something that might happen. I don't know. Um, so first thing first, where are our corner points? Our corner points are there, right? These are our corner points. If you can't see them, you can always just right click and turn them back on. Right? What I'm going to do, just to give me some space, I'm going to drag all my force objects, I'm going to group them, right? And I'm going to move all of those over here. I'm just going to a bit more space, right? These are all my force objects. And these are my these are my um, these are my actual geometry objects. Yeah, right? I'm just going to separate it out so I can see where my forces are and where my geometry is. Now I'm going to need to separate out those corner points because I, maybe I want to manipulate separate corner points. I want to maybe move up things up and down. So I'm going to go to sets and go to list. I'm going to list item. I'm going to drag it onto the canvas. I'm going to drag in my corner points in, right? At the moment, it's giving me the first item in the list because the integer here is set to zero and it's a zero-based list. It's the first item in the list. I actually want to see all four corner points and I want to do different things to all of them. So all I'm going to do is hit the little plus button here one, two, three times, 
Right, and now I have I, first item, I plus one, second item, I plus two, third item, I plus three, fourth item, and last item in our list. Yeah? I'm going to put these in the container just for my own benefit. Right? Because I'm going to do something with the points. <coughs> I just want four containers from those four points. Yeah? And what I'm going to do for the exercise today is I'm just going to try to move some of those corner points up and down. Yeah? So I'm going to move them in the Z direction in this case. You can move them in a different direction. doesn't really matter. But for this example, I'll just pick Z and we'll see what happens. So I want to move them. So I want to I want to move them in the z direction. So I need a vector in the z. I need a force. I need a um, how much to move them. So I need a slider. And in this case, for this example, I will pick. I don't know. One point zero dot dot uh, ten. Okay. Now I'm going to move them. So this is already set up a, a, a z vector, and I need to I need now to say move them, right? So I want to go to transform Euclidean and move, right? Translate move an object along a vector, right? We've set up our vector. I'm going to drag it onto the canvas. I want to move two points. I want two moves. Yeah. So just Control C, Control V, and you get two moves. Which corner points do I want to move? I don't know. I'm going to just pick the two opposite ones, right? I'm going to pick the ones opposite each other. I'm going to move those two up and down, right? Just because I think it shows maybe the best examples. I'm going to pick that one. I'm going to pick that one. Yeah? They're my opposite ones. That one and that one. They're opposite each other. And now let's see what's happening. If I swing, swivel around, if I move my side up and down, those points are now moving up and down. Yeah. As I said before, right? Our anchor points that we set up before, if we don't define a value, the original starting position of those anchor points is fixed. What we do have the ability to do is say a target value, right? Let's try to move those points to a target point position. So of course, now I've moved two points, they're my new target positions. The thing to be wary of, if you have, in this case, four target anchor points, you probably want to feed it four target points, right? Otherwise, what might happen is, it's got four and two, it's going to maybe try to move two to one location, two to the other location, right? Or it may move three to one and, and stick one where it was or something, right? We, did, we need to be very explicit what we want it to do. We want two to stay the same, and now we want two to move. So we basically want to merge this back into one list of points. So I'm going to go back to sets. I'm going to go to... Um, I can't find it where it is. Uh, merge. I'm going to double-click the canvas because I can't remember where it is. Merge. If you want to find out where something is, Control Alt and it's there. It's under Set and it's under Tree. Right, it's Merge. So I'm going to merge the point I moved, and again the order is important. So I want to move the the point that I moved, then the second point which I didn't move. I want the third point which I moved, and then I want the fourth point which I didn't move. Yeah. So now I've got a list of four points again. Does that make sense? has to be in the same order as the original list, or it's going to swap all the target points around. Target point one may be now be target point two, and things will get messy. I'm now going to plug that into my target points, and you can see what happened, right? 
And now look what happens if I move my little slider up and down. I'm now getting my little fabric structure fixed on different points. Yeah? So you could say this is the fabric stretched between some buildings and the buildings are all different heights. So I can set my, um, I can set my um, piece of fabric on four different corner points and then let it drape, right? And then if, I wanted, if it was a fabric and it was draping, I would set a negative value for that, right? I would let it drape. I would set here. I would go down to my force value here and I would put in a negative Right, and then now that's hanging. That's a hanging structure, right? But for this example, we're going to pretend it's a shell, and we're actually moving it up. Yeah. So we, you can check it's all working. Yeah. If for every reason you add in another force and you change some of the force objects you might want to hit the reset button, right? Because you're changing, the, you're changing the forces and sometimes the engine doesn't catch up. You just need to let the engine know, hey, hey, reset, right? And again, if you ever want to go back to what it was originally, <coughs> you can turn the engine off, whoop, false, and hit reset, and we've gone back to our original form, right? Our original form was a flat mesh. If we turn the engine on, we've now got this shell structure. Yeah? Happy with that? You are? You happy, Connor? I'm happy. I think I'm okay, actually. Okay, so what else do we want to do? We're, gonna, um, we're going through this pretty quickly, which is good. We're going to put a beam. We're now going to put a beam between two points and say to the fabric, you're stuck to that beam, right? You can't move off that beam object because that's where you're fixed onto. Um, and then what happens to the shape, right? So you can pull a fabric to a line, basically, yeah? And that line might represent a fixing strategy or it might be draped around a beam. We could just do a flat beam, right? We could just draw a line between two points, and we could just have a have a flat have a line, and we pull it to that line, and that's it. That's a bit boring. So let's do something a bit more exciting, right? What we're going to draw is like a little catenary arch between two points, and we're going to use that to drape our fabric over the top of, or the shell, whatever. So, what do we want to do? we need to pick our points that we want to draw the beam between. Now, in my example, I'm going to draw the beam between the points that I moved, right? Which are those ones. Yeah? So I'm just going to do parameters and I'm going to draw some point. I'm going to two point components. I'm going to put in one and two. Yeah? I'm going to draw a little catenary arch between those two. So I'm going to get a curve. I'm going to go to spline, I think. I'm going to go to catenary. Yeah. Okay, so I might sit down. What are the inputs? We have a start point. We have an end point. We have a length of catenary chain, right? So the length is if I have a line between two points and its length is one, and I want to draw a catenary chain between those. The length has to be greater than one, right? It's not going to be. It has to be greater than the original length. So all I need to say is, what was my original length? And then multiply that by a factor 
and that'll draw my catenary arch. Yeah? And this third one is the direction of gravity <laughs> that the catenary arch is, is following. In this case, it's gonna, it, by default, it acts like a hanging chain, right? It's minus one, so it's, if I increase the length, it would hang the chain. And because our geometry at this point is inverted, we're actually going to do um, a chain like an arch, right? So I'm going to do a z vector as my as my gravity is. I haven't changed it. It's now a positive z vector. My starting point is A and B. Easy. My two points, right? And my length is have to be a factor of the length between those two points, right? So I need to evaluate the length and then multiply it by greater than one. So can we work out the length? I think we can. I think we go to vector, can we? We go to point, and over here it says distance, compute Euclidean distance between points. I drag that down onto the canvas. I have a value. I don't really care what that value is right now. But what I want to do is I want to multiply that value and make it larger than the original value. So I'm going to go to math, I'm going to go to operators, multiplication, I'll drag that onto the canvas. I drag that in, and now I'm going to do a slider. One point, um, let's go 1.00, double this, do two decimal places. So 1.00, dot, dot. And let's do two. So I have a slider with two decimal places that goes between one and two. And if I put that into the multiplication, and I put that into there, and I increase my my value, you can see that my continuity arch grows in shape. Yeah. Everyone clear? You should have something like that. So what do we want to do? What do we want to tell the physics engine to do? Right? We want to tell it to stick a series of points as close as possible to that line. Right? So if if we look at kangaroo, we might be able to see um, a, a force that allows us to do that. So for this example, we'll just go in and have a look, right? Um, there's something called goals on, right? So you've got goals on curve or on mesh, right? In this case, so you could say that is a, that's a mesh, right? That's a piece of mesh geometry. I don't know what it, it might be. And we're going to try to stick some points onto that, and then also that's another constraint for us. In this case, we just have a curve representing our beam or whatever it might be, and we want the points to stick as close as possible to that beam. So I'm going to go on curve. Keep a point on a given curve, right? So the force is keep a point on a given beam. So the curve is easy, right? That's our curve. Right? The curve is our catenary arch. What are the points? Right? Does anybody, which points do we want to stick to that? Yeah. We basically want the points that run from A to B. Yeah? So the points that we want, there's no probably easy way to extract them, right? How are we going to get them out? So you could try to work out somehow as you go along that curve whether they have the same x and y coordinates. It's a bit difficult. The easiest way to do it, right, is just allow Grasshopper to solve it for you, right? Much like we have here, keep a point on a given curve, we can also find points closest to a curve, right? 
in Grasshopper, there's a component that will allow us to find the points closest to a curve. Right? So I'm going to go to uh, Curve Analysis. Right? There's a whole bunch of things we can do for curves. But the one that I'm really interested in here is Curve Closest Point. Right? And if you can't find it, it's Curve Closest Point. It's under Curve. It's there. Yeah? I'm just going to move all this down a little bit, just to make, make some space. So what points do I want to pull to that curve, and what curve do I want to use, right? Yep. The initial curve, so the initial mesh points, right? So these mesh points, if I turn them back on, are all of those points, right? All of those points are on the ground, and what we've got is a form-found geometry, or our, or our catenary arch is already up in space a little bit higher than that, right? And why we're going to find um, the closest points to that curve is we'll say if the value, the distance from that curve is greater than a number, don't don't discard those points, right? Ideally, those points would lay on the curve. So if the distance is greater than zero, the points don't lay on the curve. I don't want to use them. right? That's the way we're going to use that logic to sort out our points. So what I can't do, I can't use our catenary arch. right? Catenary arch is already in space. It's already too far away. And when I look use a distance function, the distance is... It won't be able to let me sort it out because the catenary arch is too far away. What I should do is draw a line back in the original starting position where our points are and use that line to find out, right? And if, as long as I draw the line in the same position, so directly underneath my catenary arch, and use that, I should be able to sort out my points. Yeah? So the points that I want to use in this case are the points before they're moved. So these two, yeah? The ones that are laying on the ground. Yeah? So I could do... I'm going to draw two points up here. And I'm going to do the points that lay on the ground, and I'm going to bring them up to here. So those two, right? The first and the th third. Right? The ones that lay in the corner directly underneath my arch. I'm now going to draw a line, line component between those two points. Right? <coughs> and now I want any point, any point along that line that's on the line. Right? So, yeah? And you can see now the distance should be zero, right? It should be directly on that line. So it should allow me to use like a simple bit of logic to say any point that's greater than zero, hey, ignore it, right? Let those points spring around and do whatever they want to do. The ones that are on that line, I want, to, I want to attach them to my catenary arch. Yeah? How do we do that? We have our little curve closest point, right? We have a bunch of... Um, we have a bunch of curves to project onto. So we have, um, we have one line, is our curve, and we need all of our points. All of our points are these ones, right? All of our mesh points. So I'm going to drag that in to another container, a fresh one, just so I can use that. I'm going to drag it all the way up here. And I'm going to put that into that. Yeah? Getting a bit messy, so I'm just going to turn some of these values off. What I've got now is all of those points pulled to that line, right? 
what I want is only the points which the distance which actually is given to me right there's a value here at the bottom here that says distance I'm going to use those values so if the value is is zero they, they're the points I'm interested in right or ignore all the other ones so sort out my list by those values so if I go to math I can go to operators I think in here <coughs> or, yeah yeah sorry larger than right I'm gonna pull that onto the canvas right so if the number is larger than zero ignore it so I want a panel I want to put the value zero in here Double click in there, type zero, right? And plug that into B, and my distance goes into A, right? What is that going to give me, right? Larger than, right? So it should just give me, in this case, a set of Booleans, right? <laughs> it's going to tell me if it's true or false. So I should have in one list a whole bunch of trues. And another list, oh sorry, let me just, it's all good? There were falses in there. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah sorry, you can see them, right? Is this not many? There you go. There's some falses. Ah, don't move it. Yeah? So we're after the falses. We're after the one that it's not greater, right? So what I can do is I can use those Boolean values to basically sort out my list, right? With anything like this, you can use Boolean values to sort lists. So if I go back to sets, which is where you do all your list um, cleaning and, and functions, there's one in here called dispatch, right? If I drag it onto the target, I take my original points and I put in I can put another just in case. I don't know what my units are. Um so what I've used in here is my list to filter is my original point list, right? And my filter criteria, my dispatch pattern, is a Boolean list, right? So if it's true, it should go to A, and if it's false, it should go to B, right? So there should be a lot more trues, a lot more points aren't on the line, right? So they'll be in A, because it's, uh, they're further away than 0, 0 0.1. And if it's B, they're under that value, so basically they're on the line, I should have about 21 points, yeah. Right? Does anyone understand what I've done there and how I've used that to sort out that list? I've taken all my points and I've drawn a line. I've then found out where the closest points, I've used the distance away from the line, where the original points were, because it gives me that value, to sort out my list. So then by, I just... I want a boolean set of boolean values, true and false. So I use, I check whether that value is larger than the target number that I have, and then I split that list by using those boolean values. Yeah. I might just put a contain in here just to check. Yeah. If I put the other one in, you'll see I've got loads more points. Yeah. They're all the points that aren't on the line. And now these are all the points that are on the line. Yeah? And the ones that we want, right, are the ones that are on the line. These are our values which we want to stick to our catenary arch. Yeah? So, in they go. It's another force. I'm now going to put that into my forces. I 
might want to reset and see what happens. And now, because again, all of these are now done, I'm just going to turn them all off. I don't want to see my original values, I'm going to turn them off. Preview off. I just, well, I might want to draw my, keep my catenary arch on. Just my catenary arch, and just my outputs are on. Again, we haven't set a value here, so it's not really pulling to the arch. So let's set a value. Let's go put a slider in. Let's go from what's the original strength? Obviously, it needs to be greater than one. So let's go from one dot dot uh, fifty. As I increase that value, it pulls it to the catenary. Yeah. And change the shape of my catenary arch, and you'll see it's now going to more deform. Move my points down, original position, make my arch bigger. Yeah. If I want to. value to go down, I'm going to set that minus 10. So now you can play around with the numbers as you want. So you now play around with the values, right? And just come up with some different shapes. Yeah? And try to understand what happens when you change different values. If you change the stiffness of the edge. You can take gravity out. If you want to take a force out, you can take a force out. I think gravity is that one. Everyone happy with that? Clear what happened?
We can, of course, do what we did in the first exercise, is actually try to move one of our anchor points as well, right? So we can go to kangaroo 2. We can go to sh here. We can go to grab, which is another force. And I leave it down the bottom. And plug it in. And if I plug... <coughs> if I do alt and right mouse button, can I grab it? because I've set it as an anchor point. Yeah, I'll, I'll set them as anchor points and they won't move. You can see I can try to deform the fabric. I can stretch it. I can't move my anchor points. I mean, that's the basic principles of, of this kind of stuff that you might be interested in, right? The basic principles of things. You can add, the, you can add more objects in. I could add a bit of mesh thing and try to drape the fabric over something. I could add different types of beams in here as rigid elements and let the fabric sort of interact with those. I did think this example would take a bit longer, but you're all very good and you're very, very quick. Um, <clears throat> I can try to do something else on the fly. Or if there's any particular thing you might be interested in, I could show you that. Or if you have any specific questions about what we did today, you could ask us. We could finish early. Is that? Yeah. Is anyone not clear about how it works and why it works? It's, the definition got a bit messy. We added lots of extra bits in here. But the basic principles are keep your force objects on one side. If I add them to my group. Right? You have a bunch of force objects, you have a bunch of geometry, you feed that into the force objects, you feed that into the engine, you let the engine do its stuff, and you get an output. Yeah? What would uh, happen if we don't use the sum module? The sum module, the... Which one? Uh, the, 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 uh, the first target. Uh, the, first, uh, the first target. The show? Yeah. If you don't use that, well, you, there's only a good way to find out. Doesn't show anything. 
I mean, you, what you can do is you can see the engine, right? And the engine will show you all of the goal objects we've used to find that geometry, right? So we've used points, we've used springs, and the engine sees those by default, right? And you get those outputs by default, right? It actually gives you all the vertices of the geometry you put into it by default, right? And then you have a bunch of outputs, which in theory, uh, those force objects and the output of those objects by applying those forces. But what you see is that list is a bit of a mess, right? You see that output, as I said, is a bit of a mess, right? It's obviously got all the springs, got a whole bunch of lines, and then it's got another null at the end for some reason, I don't know what that is, and it's got a few nulls, right? And then I'm like, well, obviously I started with a mesh. I want, I want that mesh as my final object, how do I get that, right? There's no way to get that out of the force objects you put in, right? You need to explicitly tell it, I want that mesh back, right? So I need to use that show function. And that's why I always, whoa, reset. And that's why I always put it in in that way, right? I explicitly want my mesh to come out and I want to be able to bake it, right? So now I can like right click on that and bake it. And if I turn off my preview, I now have a bit of geometry, yeah, in Rhino. And I can, yeah, move it around. So I could do another iterations. I could do something else here and do another iterations and change my forces and change my catenary or whatever it is and get my results. If I didn't actually explicitly tell it to show that, there would be no way for me to get that back out. So it's and when you do examples and you see a lot of examples other people have done, it's not often that they do that. Yeah, sometimes you might do all these forces and you get all these objects out, and all all you're getting out as an output is your is your forces, your your springs and your points, and it's a bit frustrating. You're like, where's my geometry gone? But that's the best way I know to do it. Right? Someone, is to hmm? someone commented a bit like a chicken leg. A chicken leg. Well. Looks like a chicken leg, yeah. Well, maybe it's, I don't know what it's meant to represent. A light bulb? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's not the clearest icon ever. I guess it's meant to be a light bulb. Yeah. Um, there's loads of other forces in there. And one thing that we do a little bit, I think, and I think we would talk about this normally, but I thought... This time we'll do something more fabric based or shell based is we do like planarization, right? Because we work in the I work in the facade team. We have architects that come up with crazy crazy geometry and often the, the materials that we use don't like to form crazy geometry, right? So if it's like, say a piece of glass, right? A piece of glass is quite rigid, it actually doesn't really want to lend itself to bending. You can does often have a cost implication so what you may want to say is let's have some crazy bit of geometry and let's use one of the forces we want to solve for is planarity so we have this crazy mesh shape but let's see if we can manipulate it slightly and try to make everything planar right and obviously if we make all of our glass planar the cost of our facade or building goes down by a lot so there are goals that we might use like that right and that is in there um, if I think if I double click and type planarize, it has a planarize function, yeah? You have your mesh data and you have a strength and it will try to planarize your mesh quads, yeah? Obviously if it's a triangles and your, your mesh is triangles, they're all planar anyway, but if they're quads, you can actually try to planarize that, right? Try to keep one point moving out of plane as another force. It may not always work. There may be no solvable solution in some cases, and the thing won't be able to solve itself. Yeah, you'll just get some crazy result, and this thing never just keeps bouncing around all the time. Yeah. I can't think of anyone that you might want to do particularly. Um, it's worthwhile going to, if you want to find out more, I would go to um, Food for Rhino. 
And if we go to food for rhino, we have all the plugins that you can get for Grasshopper, right? You may not be able to install them on the computers here, but you might be able to install them on your laptop. And if you say in here kangaroo, you'll get the kangaroo physics engine, right? The stable release, always go for the last one. And he should have here If you go to the website, this is a forum group that gives you support for using Kangaroo. So it's worthwhile if you're having a problem using this, the forum to ask for help. Right? There are lots of examples there as well. And I'm saying the main example files, there's a link there, right? And the guy who created Grasshopper, Daniel Piker, very nice guy, he's got lots of examples here, right? I can go in and look at things about bending examples, right? And they sorted them out all by forces. If I want to look at catenary structures, what, how could I build a catenary using Grasshopper, right? He's got examples there. Um, and some of the stuff that I've done today, I think, would be under shells, maybe mesh shell, mm, tensile structures. Yeah, I think it's one of these. is very similar to what I did today. Yeah. There's lots of, lots of functionalities here, lots of examples. Um, very good place to get help. And then the, the support group here um, is quite active as well. 14 hours ago was the last posting. They've already had seven replies. Yeah? So, you know, but, but if you're going to use a support group, the, the first rule of thumb is um, please search it first if you've, before just asking a question, right? People are giving away their free time to you. If you have a question, please search it to see if someone's already asked it and answered it. Don't just say, hi, I've got a problem, and it's like you know, the second one down is the answer to your problem, but you didn't bother to read it. Yeah? People get a little bit upset. So just have a look to see if you can solve your problem. And when you do describe your problem, it is always good to maybe upload the Grasshopper file as well, yeah? So people can see what you're trying to do. Yeah? Good.